For those of you I haven't met, I'm Pam Franks. I'm the deputy director and curator of modern and contemporary art here. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, evening to get together and celebrate both David Doris's lecture and our new curator of African art, Barbara Plankensteiner, who I want to introduce and then hand the podium over to Barbara to introduce David. Before I do that, I want to remind you, as usual, to please silence your cell phones. And I also want to let you know that after the lecture, there will be a reception in um, the lobby right outside. And at that reception, there will be a couple of special promotions on past publications on African art that the gallery has produced. So check those out. The titles may be of interest to you. Um, and it's a one day only promotion. So there's a table right in the reception. So it's a real, real pleasure to introduce Barbara Plankensteiner. Barbara joined our staff last fall as the new Francis and Benjamin Benenson Foundation Curator of African Art. She came to us from the Welt Museum in Vienna, where she served for many years as the curator of Sub-Saharan Africa collections, chief curator, and deputy director. Prior to her time at the Welt Museum, she worked in museums throughout Austria. She's curated numerous exhibitions with a primary focus on the art of southern Nigeria and the Benin Kingdom, including um, African Lace, a history of trade, creativity, and fashion, in Nigeria, and Benin Kings and Rituals. The catalogs for both of these exhibitions have become standard references in the field, and they're just two of numerous scholarly books, exhibition catalogs, and um, articles on African art, ethnography, and material culture that Barbara Plugensteiner has authored over the years. She's maintained also a very strong commitment to teaching over these years. For the last um, decade plus, she's taught regular courses and seminars focusing on museum anthropology and African art at the Institute for Cultural and Social Anthropology in Vienna. And indeed, I think the opportunity to work with students was one of the great appeals of coming to work at Yale. Um, since joining the Yale University Art Gallery just last fall, her big, first big project has been planning a reinstallation of the permanent collection galleries of African art. This will open next fall, actually move spaces down to the ground floor of the museum, and it promises to be an exciting new perspective on the collection that we're all looking forward to, and I hope that you will all join us in eager anticipation to see. Um, so Barbara, you're very welcome here as a new colleague, and you're welcome to come up to the podium and introduce David. So thank you very much, Pam, for these really kind words. And now I continue with introductions. We have a series today uh, because I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker for this evening, um, David Doris. And I'm very excited uh, to introduce this first lecture that I'm able to initiate here um, at the gallery. And I'm confident that there will be more to come in the next future. And I'm very thankful uh, to Pamela Franks and Roline Theodore to make this uh, possible, and also to their department, uh, and as well as Beth Sodens, the museum assistant in the uh, African Art Department for the organization. Um, please take note maybe also for our next lecture that we will host um, on April 28. It will be uh, Professor, the archaeologist uh, Professor Peter Breunig from Frankfurt uh, University who will speak about the Nock Enigma. Uh, but now to David Torres. <laughs> who is the focus of our evening today, obviously. Uh, David uh, Doris is Associate Professor of African Art and Visual Culture at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in the Department of the History of Art, the Department of Afri Afro-American and African Studies, and the STEM School of Art and Design. His PhD dissertation, written under the mentorship of Robert Ferris Thompson here at Yale University, received the 2004 Roy Sieber Memorial Award for Outstanding Dissertation in African Art History from the Arts Council of the African Studies Association. He has been a Fulbright Scholar in Nigeria uh, and had several fellowships, uh, also a Smithsonian Postdoctoral Fellowship at the National Museum of African Art. 
uh, and he was a residential fellow at the Getty Research Institute. His book, uh, Vigilant Things on Thieves, Yoruba Anti-Aesthetics and the Strange Fates of Ordinary Objects in Nigeria, published by uh, University of Washington Press in 2011, addresses the moral, ethical, and aesthetical roles of assemblages of useless and discarded objects in contemporary Yoruba culture. In 2012, this book, Vigilant Things, received the African Studies Association's Melville Herskowitz Award, presented for the most important scholarly work in African studies published in English during the preceding year, which he thinks is pretty cool, and I think we also think that. I knew this, his book before I met David Torres. I met him only this morning. Um, and was then immediately captivated by his unconventional writing and his fresh and unprecedented look at Yoruba art by focusing on what he translated as traditional somethings. In relation to African art in general and the dichotomy of looking at it from a Western or local African perspective, I found it really compelling how he speaks of these cultural constructs as having the power to make things hap happen because they are seen. With this, he, is actually, he actually refers to a visual power quite different to how we would conceive it for works of art. But somehow, both ways are related and tell us a lot of the meaning and value of such works in African societies. In his lecture today, he will shed a new light on power and visuality in Yoruba culture. He will look at examples of Edan Ogboni, of which we have a very fine example in our collection here uh, at the Yale University Ar Art Gallery that we have placed on view for the occasion up in the gallery, and you can see it uh, tomorrow because today the gallery will be already closed. Um, uh, these are finely cast uh, brass figures of a female and male with iron packs, originally owned by honored elders of the ancient Ogboni secret society. And uh, he associates them with clumps of earth scooped from the ground and set down to mark and protect property. David Doris announced to address a haunting question. Are there really no visual? Are there really no visual representations of God, Olodumare, in uh, Yoruba culture, as scholars have claimed, or have they just been looking in the wrong place? So we are all very eager to hear the answer to this. Please welcome David Torres, and as he always writes in his emails, may all good things be yours. Welcome. How's everything on your arrival? To which you might say, Adupe. So let me try it out. We give thanks. That's what Adupe is. It means we give thanks that we're here. And um, I certainly do. Uh, would not have been possible had I not, for instance, been asked to come. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Barbara for that. And uh, as well, Pamela and uh, Liz and Beth, both of whom are named Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth uh, but I find that if you say Liz and Beth at the same time, it's really just, it's a two-in-one package. Uh, and uh, Maureen as well, thank you so much for taking such good care of me uh, because uh, the last few days as I've been trying to think about this material, um, I, I sure haven't been able to take care of myself. And, uh, but I have a project that I'd like to, to share with you. Um, it's a project that grows out of material that I've been working on previously. 
And uh, let me just give you a little written introduction. I may drift in and out of reading um, as we go. Reading here, I'll talk now and again. Uh, probably more talking than reading. Uh, this is very much a project that is in Kuwait, a project that has been resistant in a lot of ways uh, to my efforts to try to understand, uh, partly because it is veiled in mysteries, and I mean real mysteries, silences. Uh, people who know don't talk, and this is never truer than with this society of honored elders called the Ogboni. Um, <clears throat> So some real fundamental questions arise, like what do you say when no one is giving you information to relate and, in effect, permission to say? And it's an important question that arises out of ethnographic work. Um, let me just give you a and kind of intro just to uh, get the wheels started and my brain perhaps spinning. Um, we're looking at a handful of dirt. I'll get to that in just a moment. Like dogs and chickens, we humans are dazzled by shiny objects. We want to peck at them, snap them up, strut them around the yard, bury and hoard them in places where they'll remain forever ours. We can't help but stare when others show us their shiny objects, which impress us and hold us in thrall. We are easily convinced that the owners of glittering things, illuminated by their flash, must also hold the key to something greater and more lasting, some sort of power, knowledge, access, skill, that transcends the ordinary and justifies such mesmerizing display. Those objects signify the presence of power and are meant to convince us of it. Reading them, we come to know the shapes power takes in the world. Captivation is our unwitting consent to power's utterance, its completion. In that eager captivation, however, it's easy to overlook aspects of objects that indeed might well be intended to refuse our inquiries and interpretive efforts. We are not meant to read them or know them or even to see them uh, for that matter, though surely they're there to be seen. Even as they convey the presence of power, they shut down our access to it, guarding the owners of those objects, the bearers of power, from compromise and depletion. We see what we expect to see and celebrate our capacity to decode and so understand what we've seen. Through our efforts, we might feel we have come to share in that power, maybe even taken the upper hand in the process, but it isn't so. All the while, we've missed the point, which was there the whole time, right in front of our faces. And a point, as it turns out, is precisely what is at issue here, a literal point, a peg made of iron. And to get to that, I need to give you a little bit of background into what I've done previously because it opens up onto this in a very direct way. Um, in 1998, I was sitting by the side of a road in Ile Ife, Nigeria, where the Yoruba people, some 25 million strong and powerful presence in the diaspora, where Yoruba say that the world began, began in Ile Ife. Uh, the origin of the people of the world. And I was there by the side of the road, and I was talking with a friend of mine. About, uh, I was talking uh, with this friend about Ale. Uh, Ale, a type of object, uh, an assemblage of object, quite, uh, assemblage of objects quite often, that are set in place to warn thieves of the of uh, the consequences of their actions. They are aworan, images, as translated into Yoruba, images that we look at and remember. And that, that term, rather than art, say, uh, which has no precise equivalent in Yoruba, is one that I find incredibly useful and quite compelling. The notion of an image in Yoruba is one that takes time into account. An image doesn't simply reveal itself, but is expected to work 
in a prospective way. It's something that you're going to remember in the future. And it also reminds you that it has been somewhere, that you have been somewhere. Both of you have histories. If you can translate this object, it suggests that you share some aspects of culture. That you are each, that you are yourselves bound together through this history. Awara, we look at and remember. Uh, now, that is a term that is also used when referring to objects such as this um, Olumeye figure, uh, the one who knows honor, uh, as it's called. Uh, uh, a an object that you may know from this very museum. It's upstairs. Uh, a classical Yoruba artwork. Ele Yoruba Dile. Okay. Uh, the, the works I was addressing were themselves images, Aworin, just like that, but comprised of objects that had themselves been subject to other forces that had been effectively used up, transformed into trash, and then brought back into the visual field as things that one would look at and remember. And prospective images, that is, telling a thief that if you were to come to this property, this property which I have marked as my own, indexed effectively, you will be like an old shoe stepped on for the re remainder of your life, worn through, and then as a reward for that labor, tossed in the trash. You will wear rags, the rags of poverty. Like a broom, you will be dragged through dirt and shit and worn down to a useless nub. And then, like a comb, or the comb here is, is doing something quite different, it's speaking across image into language as well. And a comb is oya. Meaning it's uh, roughly, it separates, it separates hairs and beautifies the head, certainly, but in doing so it also causes pain to the head as it disentangles knots. In effect, saying you will be, um, you will be removed from others, from society, just as easily as hairs can be separated from each other. So this, this kind of assemblage of metaphorical materials, uh, analogical materials, likening the thief to all of these objects. This will be you. And I, speaking from a position of power, make this utterance. The power that is in the truth of the land, the ownership of that land, right? And here it is. <clears throat> Sitting by the side of the road, a man comes up. He says, I, I hear you talking about, I'm, I'm going to get a little better view, if you don't mind, from over here. Um, says, aha, you're interested in Ali. I will show you an Ali. I said, OK, thank you. I walked over to a pile of wood and went to the earth, and just, scooped it, just went down to the ground, scooped up a handful of earth, and put it down. And I said, is that Ali? That's Ali. I said, aha, uh -huh. well, what does it do? Well, it tells someone that they should not thief from here. I said, well, what will happen if somebody steals from here? Right. Um, and he said, well, it, I, I, I had already understood that earth was sometimes used in, uh, to make these kind of objects. Um, it might portend that a thief might have an earthen wall fall on his or her head. It might suggest that uh, that person has no children to bury them after death. So a very powerful image. Richard Burton, in the, uh, the explorer, the adventurer, the translator of the Thousand and One Nights, um, in 1863, saw one of these um, in a market near Abeokuta and said that it worked because it was infused with a kind of magic that Mungo Park calls Kwang. And Mungo Park never mentioned this word Kwang anywhere in his literature. But 
that's even beside the point. He was speaking about some sort of, th th that somehow this earth was somehow imbued with a kind of magic potency. And it wasn't about that at all. It was the power of, its, of this displacement of the earth as an image in becoming an abura, something that we look at and remember. What effectively happened was the earth itself, right, this space that is effectively infinitely vast, right, that is older than we might know, that will endure beyond all of us, right, that contains the spirits of and the bodies of all who have been born in this world, lived and died since the beginning of things. All of that was effectively brought into this handful of earth, which he placed down here. And I said, well, what, ha what will happen to a thief if he steals from here? And he said, well, nothing has to happen to him. Fear has its own torments. And I said, first, mm, I thought, Thanks for the sound bite, man. It's a good one. But I didn't know what to make of it at first. And I went home and I thought about it. <clears throat> and, oh, excuse me. I was saddened, in fact, by what happened because I realized that the power here, that he was really uh, talking about this power of the earth, had long been administered or said to have been administered by a group, a secret society, as it's called, a secret society called Ogboni, the Ogboni Society. And I remember just saying, oh, damn, I don't want to deal with Ogboni society. I didn't like their art, for one thing. I was dealing with all these abstract objects and such, and it was this rigid, imperious, bronze and overconfident quality to their material. The stuff of royalty, really, is what it is. And I didn't want to be in that place, but I couldn't avoid it because the same stuff that constituted those objects was somehow present in that handful of dirt, in that handful of earth. So, as they say, one thing led to another. And I would, since I do not, since we're talking about elders here, Agbalagba, Agbalagba, okay. Agbalagba, uh, elders among elders. I'd like to read to you something about, about Ogboni. Ogboni, which is called Oshubo in the Ijebu and Egba regions of southwestern Nigeria, is at the Yoruba Association of Honored Elders. In a traditionally gerontocratic society such as Yoruba, these elders would be regarded as extraordinary vessel, vessels of wisdom, Ogbon, uh, and experience. As an association of elders, Agbalagba, literally adults who have adults, the parents of parents, that is, uh, the powerful men and women who comprised Ogboni membership stood at a privileged remove from ordinary life. Already blessed with children, money, land, and indeed long life, they had no compelling need to seek further social advancement from their gods. Instead, as Robert Ferris Thompson notes, they could deal without distractions of petty ambition and hierarchic insecurities with the primary matters of the law. Incidentally, I would like to dedicate the good parts of this uh, talk to Robert Ferris Thompson uh, today, my Baba, Agba Lagban, who could not be uh, here tonight. I owe you my life if you're listening, Baba. The Ogboni created and repealed laws and were empowered to hunt down, judge, and punish those who broke them. In the case of the gravest offenses, the group could enact death sentences through its punitive arm, the Oro Society. Ogboni thus wielded a certain power over life and death and presided over the burial rites that marked its elderly members' passage between those worlds. 
As elders, they stood in preparation at the cusp of death, and so it is said, continued to live their earthly lives as if they were already dead. Which is to say, as strange and exalted as ancestors themselves, numinous, at once intimately close, and impossibly distant. Obuni was not and is not a religious organization as such, but its membership included the highest ranking Orisha priests and priestesses. And by Orisha, I mean the divinities, the embodied uh, divinities of Yoruba power, the manifestation of one, the one god, Olodumare's power in this world. Um, they were also constituted by laymen and women of achievement in, in many vocations. It united this disparate group through a fraternal bond that not only cut across religious, ethnic, and ideological lines, but superseded them. Likewise, said art historian William Fagg, Obuni provided an important integrative element linking the innumerable towns of Yoruba land. For a member of the Obuni in any town is freely received as a full member in the Obuni house of any other town. Obuni was once the eminence grise behind Yoruba kings with a collective power greater even than that of those near divine beings. Kings upon their enthronement were and still are typically initiated into Obuni and so beholden to them. It was, in some cases, remains a senate endowed with the authority to install, uphold, check, or destroy regimes. This was certainly the case in the early 20th century when Leo Frobenius characterized Obuni as quote, that institution in whose hands lies the direction of all practical political power among the Yoruba. So this is scary stuff. <laughs> I'd been working with farmers and now was working with ghosts. By the way, I'm showing a couple of uh, photographs here that are ripe with all sorts of historical implications um, from dating from, uh, in this case, 1896, um, the other 1908, um, at a time when Nigeria was, what would become Nigeria is going through many changes and the Obuni society is going through tremendous pressure uh, as a result of imperial, uh, British imperial encroachment. This is a place I want to be headed. Uh, I don't want to be headed, but uh, thanks very much. You're talking about Ogboni. It, it happens to be a preferred mode of execution. Uh, I, I, I intend to head in, in this direction. Right now, I'm, I'm setting history aside. That's why I've put no dates um, here. Uh, I want to sort of dwell in this very peculiar space with you. Um, the reach of Ogboni extended far beyond the local. Um, its far-flung membership providing highly placed contacts by which they could amass political power across eth ethnic and even national boundaries. It was, in effect, a pan-Yoruba organization avant la lettre, even before the broad application of the unifying term Yoruba in the 19th and 20th centuries. Richard Burton testified to the formidable political power of Ogboni in the Egba region of Yoruba land, uh, intimating that in the mid-19th century, the society had the expansive strength to frustrate even the British imperial forces. And, and he says this, the power of the Ogboni is unlimited. It extends from Abiokuta to Sierra Leone, all across West Africa, that is, where the Aku Company is a term that describes Yoruba, form a complete vehmet and no far, uh, foreigner can expect to swim against such a tide. This may explain the later failures of our political relations with Abiyokuta. And the Egba is stubborn, most suspicious, and hard to change when he has adopted an idea. It is to be feared that without main force, which we cannot apply, the Ogbonis will succeed in defeating all our best intentions. Such superlative power is a function of the organization's spatial reach, to be sure, but also of its proclaimed antiquity. 
The historical moment and place of Ogboni's origin are the subjects of some contention, but according to Ogboni uh, self-representation, the organization is very old indeed. As anthropologist Peter Morton Williams notes, Ogboni predates divine kingship, a compelling thought if we consider that it was said to have begun with the advent of Odudua, the first human, the founder of civilization. However apocryphal such a claim may be, it is powerfully suggestive. Obuni members, united beyond the countless differences that comprise earthly life at any given moment, locate the group's origin in prehistory, before the construction of those differences, before the construction of society, nations, religions, gods. From that perspective, absolutely unprovable by historical evidence, Oboni is the eldest among all earthly institutions, and thus the most powerful. It is invulnerable to political contingency because it transcends history itself. The group, then, is unshakably self-confident, well defended within a conceptual fortress of primordial mystery. Here, uh, an image from Leo Frobenius's massive work, The Voice of Africa, um, an image by Carl Arian, who accompanied uh, Frobenius on his journey, and illustrated it with watercolors. I have this here to represent a kind of problem. When we're dealing with such an extraordinary power, a group that perceives itself to be of this monumental and unsurpassed power in the world, what do we, and by that myself in my role as a, an ethnographer of sorts, What do we expect to gain from them? What do we expect to know about what it is that justifies them, that allows them to have access to this extraordinary power? When we ask them, there's a certain presumptuousness about it. We expect that they will reveal unto us these truths. Right? There's a certain sort of colonial mentality that's still in, in here as in that. Uh, Leo Frobenius was especially uh, arrogant in his own imposition. He said, uh, he said to himself, I'm going to do everything I can to be initiated into Ogboni. And he was initiated into Ogboni. I don't believe it was precisely the case that he was really initiated into Ogboni, but it was enough for him to think so. And um, for one thing, he, he, would, he had a proxy um, take his own role in, in this. Um, so in initiations like this, address to one's head is going to be profoundly important. His own head wasn't in the mix, as it were, so there's already a certain distance that's going on. Frobenius was very excited about this because he had heard that the Oboni were, well, they certainly executed criminals, but they did it as human sacrifice. And he wanted to have that experience. Reading the voice of Africa, it's amazing. He's lusting for to see some human sacrifice. Instead, the Oboni brought forth ducks. And, um, and that's what was sacrificed. He, he seemed truly disappointed. <laughs> but he was convinced that he had pulled one off over the, over the Oboni. Yeah, I'm in, and now they've got to tell me everything. I was initiated, and now they're going to come forward with what they know. But what extraordinary arrogance Th that to think that his own intelligence somehow was, was superior to these very old gentlemen who had seen the world and who would certainly be suspect of an intruder asking questions about their ultimate power. There have been other ethnographers, maybe not quite as arrogant as, um, as, as Frobenius was. And they too are asking, have been asking questions about Obuni, what, what this means, what that means, why this, why that. 
And where does this come from? And what is it that is your motivating power in this world? Why we would expect them to reveal that? I don't know. There's so much at stake. Now let's talk about some stuff. <laughs> if Ogbuni were not especially forthcoming here in my own sort of efforts to understand, and they typically weren't, um, I did have a chance to work with some material, um, had a chance to uh, had a chance to speak with speak with many Ogboni who told me all sorts of things that had very little to do with Ogboni. Uh, there was always a silence that attended and very little I could come away with. I did at one point meet uh, Baba Lau. It was more than a meeting. He became my Baba a father. He called me his son. He worked with me throughout my research and other matters and occasionally we would talk about Ogboni, almost incidentally, because it seemed to come up quite often when I was working with the Ale. Different roads, one after the other, seemed to lead back to this, this source of power, right? Beyond lineages, right? Ashe, the, that the power to make things happen that uh, Barbara mentioned before. This power to make things happen is something that goes back through time. One calls forward these forces from the past that are always more ancient and vaster than oneself. Oshitola, a babalawo, kolowole oshitolo, a diviner, uh, was very informative about a lot of things. And introduced me to some Ogboni material. But even then, this man, who I called Baba, he called me Omo, he would, he came to a point where he said he could not talk. And I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> Edom, that's what we're looking at here. They're the best known objects associated with Ogboni, the ancient so-called secret society. It's to these objects that must direct the, our attention with occasional side trips to other objects as we go. They're emblems of individual membership in the society, commissioned upon the initiation of many, if not all, members, and their construction could not be simpler. There are two staffs connected by a chain. Each staff is arranged in two principal portions, a superstructure featuring a more or less finely worked cast brass figure, typically one male and one female, which, if not always apparent, is always assumed, and an iron peg of variable length, usually crudely finished, protruding vertically below each figure. A brass chain links the two figures at their heads, enabling the staffs to be suspended from the neck and draped over the shoulders of an Oboni member during public performances. The two linked staffs are regarded as one object, and it is meant to be a highly visible thing, according to cultural historian Sio Adepegba. Eda is the only sacred object of the Ogboni seen by the public. At the same time, Eda has been described by sociologist Nathaniel Akinremi Fadipe as the only thing that was secret in Ogboni. From the start, then, we have to address Edam as a paradoxical object that has a very special signifying task to perform. To begin, I want to take seriously uh, Adepegba and his etymology of the noun Edam, in which the constituent ver verb da means to forestall or frustrate someone's efforts, particularly through supernatural means. Uh, Abbe Pegba, who wrote this essay only about two decades ago, was the first to actually address 
that etymology, and it's quite a compelling thing. It, it, it is an intriguing philological point for sure, and it begs some questions. What if this edon is intended to frustrate or forestall efforts to comprehend what it signifies? Edom proffer a set of iconographic and symbolic elements that are readily perceived and deciphered. They constitute a kind of overdetermined code addressing the broad public ideology of Ogboni power. But what if that code is itself a kind of dissemblance intended to thwart all efforts to perceive a deeper moment of knowledge that by necessity can only belong to the most advanced Ogboni initiates. The means of such a dissemblance would hardly need to be supernatural, um, and I suspect they're not here. Rather, they're sutured into the very framework of display and perception by which the Ogboni represent the world as obvious, a coherent ideological system which they manage as its intimidating but ultimately beneficent caretakers. Within that framework, the logic of such power, its justification, is expressed not through legible icons and translatable symbols, but through illegibility and occlusion. Meant to be seen, but harboring secrets, even in its visibility, Eddam is at once a staging and an occlusion, marking both a presence and an absence. This simultaneous presence and absence is, I hear knowing laughter. You have seen the Reform Ogboni fraternity, small parenthesis here. As I speak about Ogboni, it's important to note and, and to, in a sense, bracket that Ogboni has is, is many organizations. Um, I'm, I'm speaking of what might be called Ogboni Ibile, um, the, the, the ancient version of Ogboni, right? But over the course of the last 150 years, Ogboni underwent several sorts of pressures, right? Again, imperial pressures, colonial pressures, uh, religious pressures. Um, it meant to, in effect, dissolve that uh, corporation. It flexibly transformed itself and is split off into several different groups, many groups, uh, in, 19, oh, um, in 1914, uh, for example, is the year that Nigeria became Nigeria. Um, a, uh, a, um, a, a um, what's his name? Ogumbi, no, you, excuse me, I've forgotten, his, forgotten the name for a moment. Uh, the Christian Ogboni, society was created. And uh, this as a way to bring Ogboni to Christian communities, bring, bring Ogboni to Christian, uh, excuse me, to communities in, in a way to um, help transform, to convert, okay, as a kind of translating moment. Um, this itself came under attack when it was discovered that the Ogboni Society was using Bible um, in a way, quote, as had pagan emblems. That is to say, the Bible was being kept inside of a calabash, was in effect being contained and used as an object of power rather than a text. So something else was being translated here. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> soon enough, uh, in the 1940s, the Ogboni, again, went under a kind of name change. It became the Reformed Ogboni Fraternity. And you're looking at this now. I think the Reformed Ogboni uh, Fraternity has a nice ring to it. It suggests that, you know, there's some penitence involved and the old heathenish ways have parted for, you know, the new and the, the enlightened. Uh, anyway, so here, uh, Ogboni... Uh, Ogboni houses are called iledi, houses of secrets, houses of concealment. And quite often they had been the first uh, buildings established in new towns. Right. 
Uh, and so they were, in effect, public buildings on central and public lands. Uh, but at the same time, there was no access to them. There were no windows. Uh, they, were, they are typically gated shut. So you have something that is at also at once present and absent. You see the building, know something is going on, hear sounds even, and yet there's no access. So this kind of offering a kind of a presence and a withdrawal at the same time seems to be a particular dynamic of Ogoni presentation, central and shrouded. Um, within Ogoni, there's a notion of transparency, of inversion, um, that, um, as Robert Farris Thompson said, to become Ogoni is to become transparent. The Ogoni member is a man turned inside out, revealing the odd left inner side to his existence. Um, here we see a, a gentleman and two uh, ladies, uh, elders, Agbalagba, members of Ogboni, who are wearing tagbe, a tagbe, a uh, cloth associated with the society. Um, it's roughness, if you want. It's uh, kind of hyper textured. Um, it, it's it's hyper texture that suggests the n reverse side of the cloth. It is, in effect, as if we, uh, as if they're revealing their guts. Right, revealing their guts to each other, certainly. Um, likewise, um, there is an inversion that happens with an emphasis on the left. The left hand is used for eating, for, do, for doing, uh, for all sorts of ritual purposes. For it, it is advanced in a way that ordinarily is meant for the right, for the right hand. It is. Um, <coughs> Sort of a turning away from a very explicit cultural uh, cultural norm, and it's often been said that the Ogoni do this is because they are asserting spirit, the spiritual over the real, over the real, over the material world. Right, that the left overcomes the right, and this is the space in which they dwell. I I'm less inclined to think that. I think they do it because they can. Because here are men and women who have, in effect, been through this particular world and have in effect, transcended that to a space, the space in which they, as Agbalagba, as elders, are united. A space of freedom that allows them to translate, to transform, to overturn what is um, given as a social norm, which in many cases I think Oboni would like to think that they have a hand in making. <coughs> Let's talk about the Edan. The Edan do this too. The Edan show us something and then at the same time take us back from it, disallow us entrance. If we look at this one object on the left, a fairly simple object, right? a fairly simple Edan, we see two brass figures, one female shown here, uh, shown vagina, her, her hands holding her uh, breasts, a male uh, figure. We know this because he has a penis. And it's rare that you see penises, vaginas, exposed in Yoruba art. It's typically not the case. Right? But in, in Obuni, it's, it's, it happens constantly. Here are images of elders. Here, men and women, Agbalagba, elders who are depicting themselves as they would like to be seen, right? As monumental, right? There's a certain, it, it's been observed quite often that there's a certain lack of temporality in these things, that they are still static things, posed, 
one against the other. And in that posing of the one against, another, uh, against the other, we have what would seem to be a very neat structuralist binary, right? It is male and female. In Yoruba, tako tabo, ejiwapo. Male and female are together, right? So it takes this one kind of ideological moment, presents it as a kind of absolute, right? <clears throat> as we move up, though, we look at their faces, and there's nothing any longer to distinguish one gender from the other. It's as if somehow they have transcended that gender, that gendering in their faces, right? That these are men and women who have lived beyond their reproductive years. Certainly, and I hope it's the case for those of you who are Agba Lagba elders, that the, not their sexual years, right? But reproduction as such is something that's behind, and yet it returns this, the, this, um, the, the, the sort of sexualized or the gendering of bodies here, right, is attached in this kind of strange, uh, over-determined way. What's, what's happening? presentation on the one hand of, of this kind of ideological binary, if you want, something that makes sense, something that is absolutely clear, something that is completely legible to anyone who would see it at a moment's notice. It is assumed that they are male and female. Tibi tire la da ile aye, the world and everything in it at all times are constituted by positive and negative valences. And scholars have typically uh, spoken of these two different moments as being, uh, uh, th these two gendered moments as being associated with positive and negative. Female as positive, the, uh, and the, uh, also associated with the left, male as kind of negative, and associated with the, the right hand, and so forth. And so it all kind of falls out in this strange division, right? And yet, the objects themselves, as we move forward, suggest something else. Something else is happening here. Right. <clears throat> they are, for one thing, chained together. Uh, this, this chaining suggests that be they belong to each other, that together they constitute a complete utterance. They are prestige objects, for sure. The only Oboni uh, uh, objects that are worn in public, they are meant to be seen. And what extraordinary statements they are. They express the condition of elderhood as, again, monumental. And they do not shy away from the realities of aging. If many Yoruba uh, sculptures, as Robert Forrest Thompson has, has suggested, and others have as well, seem to modulate, to modulate the, the, sort of the, the vicissitudes of, of individuality as etched onto the skin, the individual person, these embrace, these embrace, th these are figures that are wrinkled, gathered together. Um, th their faces are, are large in some cases, some in, uh, often kind of homuncular, right? Uh, but here, quite extraordinary. If you look, both figures are bearded, um, reckoning with facts of hormonal change. Uh, women of a, of, at a certain age, have some hormonal shifts. Beards happen, right? Likewise, men become more attenuated, right? Softer as they age. And this softness is here. This attenuation is um, marked by 
these very slender arms, which tend to be on uh, most, if not all, of these figures. These are figures that see beyond. They are in a particular place, chained together, belonging together as one. They become something extraordinary, something new. Agbalagba, Agbalagba meji, Ogboni meji, Odi eta, two Ogboni become three, um, is an Ogboni saying, two become a third. So here in becoming one, connected by two, this becomes a third. They are associated with something beyond themselves. Their eyes suggest a seeing beyond as well. Obuni eyes are very special, very particular. They are shaped like almonds, looking up, looking down at the same time. So seeing in two worlds at once. Here is the Edan in Yale's collection upstairs. And what a thing it is. Um, here we can see faces, both bearded, right? Down below, we get a sense that the gendering, the sexual organs are placed on top of their clothing. That these are, in fact, objects that are have a, a signifying function, that is to say that they are representing concepts rather than genitalia, okay? <clears throat> Take a look here. One, the woman on the left holds a child who is not a child at all. He's smoking a pipe. As is the old, as is the elder who is on the right. We are dealing in a numinous realm of ancestorhood. Agbalagba, the elders, who are also at the same time becoming ancestors. And <clears throat> and are showing that to us as a condition of magnificence. All of these codes speak to a kind of transcendent moment here. Here, the two, uh, the two and the pair are relating themselves, are kneeling, rather, on top of the heads of defeated enemies. Below, they are attacked by birds, aye the birds of malevolence, but are also protected from these. Right? They are very clearly unaffected by them. One thing that does not happen here, though, one thing that we do not see that we might otherwise want to take a look at, and I think that this is the point here, as it were, is the point itself. Underneath all of this bra exquisite brass, we are looking at an iron rod, unworked, right, simple, present before you, visible, and yet you completely overlook it. It's as if it's not there. And yet, I would say that this is the single most important element of the Edom. Why? Because it speaks to the production of power itself. It speaks in a code that moves beyond, beyond this kind of ideological sketch that makes sense, that is comprehensive, that allows us to glean meaning and walk away thinking we've seen something. Here, even when we've seen something, we don't tend to see it. Um, just wondering how much time might be Remaining? Getting close? All right. We don't see these things, don't value them, we overlook them, and
tend to excise them. In this uh, book, an important book, a compendium of Obuni material by Hans Witte, right, virtually every edda in the book is missing the, um, is missing the iron below, the evening that extends below. They're right in front of us, and we don't see them, partly because we expect we already have in place the category that uh, uh, for sculptural, uh, for sculpture is somehow here representing human beings. But here is another kind of making, another kind of making that has nothing to do with human manufacture. This is, in these simple iron moments, is a power that transcends lineage, that transcends ancestors, that moves all the way back to the very beginning of time. Kulavuli Ushitola, the Babalao I mentioned earlier, he, spe he, he mentioned at uh, one point to me something that I thought was extraordinary. There are many myths, of course, about how the world began. And they involve the creation of gods and so on and so forth. And the gods, of course, speak for us in some way. They encode what we are. But he explained it like this. He said, you know, at the beginning of the world, before there were kings, before there was civilization, before there was anything that we know. No gods, no kings, none of it. Elders were walking around and they were trying to understand the world. They were trying to understand what made the world work and they were digging in the earth. Digging, a great metaphor for knowledge. Can you dig it, right? For the search for knowledge. And they came upon something hard in the world. They came something hard. So they came across something hard under the surface of the earth, and they took it out, and it was iron. And they brought that iron back to their iledi, the house of concealment, and kept it there. It reappears in the Edom, but we still don't see it. Right? What was that moment? What was the moment of manufacture? that produced this rupture in the earth, this transformation of the earth in its virtual infinitude, in its endless material presence, right? What was it that transformed it? The word typically is that the Obuni say that the earth is the source, the source of their power, their justification for being, that all things arise from this earth. And that is so. But this finding of the iron suggests something else beyond that, something else that does not participate in ordinary materiality as we consider it but of an ashe that originates itself, an ashe that came before even the production of the earth. That could only have come from one place beyond this world that would be power itself, ashe pa pa, power as such before ideology, before the differences and the diversions and the ideologies of kingship and nation and religions. Ashe papa, power itself. Um, this is sometimes called God. In Yoruba, Olodumare, it's Jehovah, Allah, but to Add those names is even to miss the point. Right. The Ogboni perceive themselves as moving beyond all of that naming of that power, incorporating it into the material that they use, that they bring to bear on the world, and that they show us. They show us the very source of the power. They show us its 
trace, excuse me, this is Babalawa Hoshitola, excuse me, go back again. They show us its trace in the only way that it can be shown, not as a symbol, not as an icon. It doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't look like anything, but as an index. This iron has been touched by power itself. It cannot be symbolized. It cannot, it has no iconicity. But it is the proof of that transformation, the index. It draws us back to a source that is always greater than any attempts to encapsulate it. And that, in the end, is the beginning. Thanks. <laughs>Is there time for questions? Yes, sir. The one figure was holding the baby. Is that what the other figures were holding? Mm hmm. Yeah, excuse me. Um, okay, uh, this uh, one figure is holding a, a baby that is not a baby. Again, it's smoking a pipe, it is an elder. <laughs> All right. So we're dealing here with these figures are at once elders themselves, but beyond that, they are ancestral figures, right? Um, here, uh, let's see, that, am I looking correctly? Yes, quite often they're holding Edan. They're holding other Edan. So they're holding the staffs that they are themselves constituted as. Uh, two questions. So the first one, are these figurines uh, related in any way to any weapons uh, over here? Uh, oh, hi. How are you doing? Uh, are, are they related to any weapons and oh. if uh, they evolved over time? Mm -hmm. To my the first question and second question uh -huh. is, what are the, um, what are the an analogs uh, of the society in Western and Oriental cultures? If there are any. Let's see. I would say that if just for analogs, I think that quite often mystic, um, mystical societies quite often come up to the moment of the unpronounceable, unrepresentable names of, of God, the unnameable and so forth. So I can think of other uh, traditions, say Talmudic um, or even pre-Talmudic uh, traditions that speak of this very same thing. It, it happening in in word um, regarding weapons um, w one one uh, strange misunderstanding that often happens here is that the iron is associated with, is said to be associated with ogun uh, ogun is one of the orisha the gods who is associated with uh, with iron right with iron as tool really as civilizing tool that airplanes are the stuff of ogum, swords, plowshares, um, and all of that. These objects, however, are not tools. Uh, one of the peculiar moments that arises in scholarship about, the, about uh, these things is that um, there have been all sorts of attempts to decide, to describe what their function is, right? But there's, we don't know. Ogbuni use it for all sorts of purposes, but don't reveal what they might be. And I tend to think that they're not tools at all anyway. They might have um, some um, you, uh, p particular ritual applications that, you know, that they will go through, but it, it tends to be about signification, right? It is about the presence of something beyond tools whatever those tools might be. So regarding weapons, I don't believe that there's any connection. It's not associated with that. Thank you. So, yes? Oshe Pupo. Um, Kotoke, Kabu. Um, so I observer, observed um, Ogboni um, arrive at a um, site mm -hmm. and take them and place them in the ground. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that that was the purpose of it, that they were connecting it yes. to the ground, but also establishing 
their presence mm -hmm. and their authority, and yes. that that did it because it just yeah. created this, this sort of standing in front of everybody, yeah. their sort of representation. A absolutely. Th I think that's exactly right. This is where that handful of dirt, by the way, comes in in just the same way. Obuni have dominion wherever they happen to plant themselves. That is their self-perception, despite the history, right? And so, yes, this is, is you know, might, they'll be set down to the ground, which uh, allows for their, for the, these objects' completion, right? It draws them back to the earth that they are, uh, of which they are, are made, and they're transformed. Um, yeah, that's, it's a wonderful question. Actually, Um, in, I'm sorry. in your studies on site, did you come across the expression that Aaron is the shit of God? Mm. Lie, lie. I never have, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> God shits out all sorts of things, uh, but but I never, I I not I not heard that it was the the shit of God. And, and I wonder, too, if sort of iron's sort of density, its particular materiality, might be set in sort of, sort of a very pe peculiar and moralizing contrast to the ephemeral or ethereal, rather, nature of God. You know, mind and body, once again, you know, that rift. I would wonder where that came from. Where did you hear that term? I've read a good bit, yeah. um, and it came to me uh -huh. from my readings, uh -huh. so I can't cite a source. Okay. Yeah. I, I've always found iron very useful, but then I've always found you know, a good shit very useful. <laughs> so, I mean, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in your photographs, there were two women who belonged to the Society yes. of Elders, mm -hmm. but the majority of your photographs were of men. Mm -hmm. And in our society, the majority of elders, uh, there's more women who are elders than men, mm -hmm. just numerically. Mm -hmm. And f also, it was only the men who were wearing the edu. Mm. Is that? truly the case, or is that just a feature of the photographs no, you possess? I, I think those are the photographs that are, that are uh, available. I, I'm not sure exactly when, it, and I don't think we'll be able to quite ascertain just when women were brought into Obuni. Certainly there are several at a high level that put uh, that um, in any one of these iledi, these houses, um, that have Sort of the function of a kind of ritual balance, the TBT, the, the taco tabo, this kind of balance there too. Um, it has been less exclusionary, that's, that's for sure now. I mean, if we go back to this picture and we look at um, uh, this image, there are no women there at all. Right. But remember, it was only 1969 that Yale went co ed. Right? So, yeah, so things change. <laughs> so things change. Um, oh, yeah. Like I said, there are all sorts of very interesting tensions in these photographs. Um, he's the colonial administrator uh, here. Uh, this photograph taken just a few years. This is taken in Ijebu Ode. In 1892, the British finally managed to have their way in Ijebu Ode. They destroyed the Obuni uh, conclave, uh, the, Ile, the Iledi. Uh, and here, the Obuni, uh, they're still present, whether or not that house is there, wherever they happen to be, there they, you know, there they are. Um, I, I find it compelling that he's the only um, individual who's not actually looking directly at the camera. Uh, but I, th yeah, it, there are photographs out there that I've yet to to look at. It's extraordinary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? Uh, no? I, I was wondering, um, do the Oboni ever 
um, become involved politically? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, who am I speaking to? I can't. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, good to meet you. Um, sure, they've been uh, involved politically in all sorts of ways. Again, going back uh, to Richard Burton in 1863, clearly they had this reach uh, that was a, a, an extensive reach, not just throughout Yoruba um, groups, different ethnicities there, but across the, but across West Africa. And he went as far as to say, without their without their approval, without their involvement, the British will not be able to actually make incursions into this area. Um, uh, likewise, uh, Obuni had the power, um, again, this kind of eminence gris behind kings. Uh, King, as a member of Obuni, was beholden to them, uh, and uh, particularly in, in, in times of, of peace, right? It's a friendly, a conservative or organization. Um, in times of war, uh, the Balogun, uh, was sort of a warrior chief, if you like, um, that group came to the fore. Um, but, but here, just regarding kingship, the establishment thereof, the checking of regi regimes, yes, Obuni did have a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Didn't even get to the worm. There's a worm involved. Sure. You got a fun question. Oh, one right here. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I was wondering to the use of chains because I found it interesting that they were there was not just a chain connecting the two figures, but that there were also several points on the figures where, where chains were used. And I was wondering if you could just speak a bit more to, to that and uh, as it opposed to a similar. It is magnificent decoration. <laughs> <laughs> is magnificent decoration. I mean, they're they're just glorious. Again, these these are elders in excelsis, right? A celebration of elderhood as monumental, as eternal, really. They are agba. These are representations of the agba lagba, the elders of Obuni, but also of the ancestors as well of all of those ancestors that um, have lived in, in this world and, and have moved on and know the, know the secrets of having been alive in this world. They make a lovely sound. <laughs> Crotals, bells, again to add to add movement, to add to add life, to add vibrancy to these extraordinary beings. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.